This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. You're probably wondering, what's the relation between the man on the left, Odysseus Vasilias, and the place on the right? Well, it's a personal question for me, and so I ask myself as a classicist, as a homerist, and just as a citizen of this place, is there any relationship between the two, between the story of the Odyssey and what's going on at the center of the world these days? But I would like to triangulate it through this place. So thinking of Odysseus and his island and the farm and in some ways its insularity, as a way of triangulating with Silicon Valley as a whole, I think the Sanford is the medium term, the mediator, if you like, between these two extremes, which is to say, in, in some ways, it's very much like Ithaca. The poem itself, the Odyssey, describes Ithaca in the words of a couple of characters as rough, but a good nourisher of young men. We would have to add women, of course, uh, since the founding of this institution. There's something about Ithaca that creates the ethos of its hero. He's short, he's rough, he's tough, uh, and other things that I believe do have something to say to the picture on the bottom. So let me play philologist for a moment and uh, make you aware that you just did an Odyssean thing because you have made a nostos. Nostos is the archaic Greek word for coming home, homecoming. And uh, as well, it's related to another Greek word, naos. So the people who study Indo-European roots will tell you these are both coming from a root that means to arrive or to come back. Nostos and naos are interrelated and acted out in this wonderful poem that I know you all read at some point, you probably have reread. It's as if keeping your consciousness, your naos, is what ensures you getting a nostos, a way home. And it's almost impossible to translate into English the word uh, naos, without sounding too ethereal, too metaphysical. Think of something instead like what we say when someone passes out and then they come to, they regain consciousness. It's a form of sort of coming back to where you should be. And in that almost physical sense, naos and nostos are related. It, you can see why it's a good word for a tavern. I took this picture personally on the south coast of Crete on the Libyan Sea, the Nostos Tavern, which I hope is still there, restaurant and bar. Two more philological notes, because I can't stop being the philologos, the one who loves words, that's my degree. N number one, nostalgia. Well, it's true that nostalgia comes from two Greek words, nostos and algos, the word for homecoming and the word for pain, but it's actually a modern word. It was made by a learned doctor, Johannes Hofer, in Basel in 1688 to describe a particular illness that he kept noting among Swiss alpine men who had gone to the lowlands and all of a sudden had this, this heimweh, it made them physically ill. They missed the mountains so much. This kind of reverse altitude sickness in a way. So he came up with the notion of algos for the nostos. What they really needed was to go home, nostalgia. That's a kind of artificial semantic development. A more natural semantic development is one I, I can't resist telling you about because if you've traveled in modern Greece, uh, you know that one of the greatest compliments you can make to a chef or somebody in the Nostos Taverna is to say, nostimo, that is tasty. The modern Greek word for tasty, nostimo, which you see illustrated at that souvlaki stand, that's the name, nostimo, actually means homey, like coming home. So the word has evolved in two very different ways, nostalgia on the one hand, homey home cooking on the other. And you're not going to get out of here with at least reciting two lines of Greek. 
because as we return to this homecoming hero, it's important to know that from the very beginning of the poem, he's described in a certain way. And that will be my keynote today, this one underlined adjective. So after me, everybody, in remember your dactylic hexameters, Andra moi en epamusa. Andra moi en epamusa polutrapon. Hos malapola. Plante e petro yes hi rompta lietona prosa. Come on. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, anybody want to translate it? Extra credit? Tell me, yes, that's right. Moy is me. Andra is man. Tell me about the man, Musa. That's an easy one. Muse. The man who is polytropos of many turnings, polytropic, who wandered a lot, plankte, after he had sacked Epirasa, the holy citadel of Troy. And there you see him on a Boeotian vase from the 5th century being pursued across the waters by Boreas, the west wind. It's a kind of parody vase, I think. It's the polytropos nature of this hero that brings me to connect him with the place we're at. He's been all over, and he's picked up a lot of things along the way. I need to explore some of those in order to locate him in relation to our contemporary day and place. But just for your advanced reading, uh, if you would like to pursue any of the places he's been in terms of literature, art, music, you name it, three great books, The Ulysses Theme by W.B. Stanford, no relation to ours, The Return of Ulysses by the lady underneath it, uh, Edith Hall, and From Villain to Hero by Sylvia Montilio, who teaches out in uh, Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. They track hundreds and hundreds of things that Odysseus has been in since probably 700 BC. We're not really sure when the Odyssey was composed, where and why, by whom, we'll call that person Homer. One thing is clear, however, the Odyssey doesn't tell you the whole story. And when we pick up some of the other things about Odysseus, it makes him look a lot different and might make him more accessible in some ways to our own time. So a couple of points to pause on. That great poet of uh, odes for athletes. He's included in every course I know on ancient athletics, Pindar, who lived in the 5th century. He wrote a poem in which Odysseus doesn't come off well. The rich man and the poor man alike travel together to death. I expect that the story of Odysseus came to exceed his experiences through the sweet songs of Homer. This is like the first recognition of the power of PR. If it had not been for the sweet songs of Homer, you know, Odysseus would not be that great. His story came to exceed what he did. Since there is a certain solemnity in his lies, whose lies? Either Odysseus or Homer or the kind of combination. And winged artfulness and poetic skill deceives, seducing us with stories, and the heart of the mass of men is blind. People are so stupid, they believe what you tell them about Odysseus, even though he wasn't that great. For if they, this is the people who got suckered, had been able to see the truth, then mighty Ajax, in anger over the arms of Achilles, would never have planted in his chest the smooth sword. Ajax was rooked out of the arms of Achilles, probably by Odysseus, uh, he killed himself, that's what this refers to. Ajax, who was the most powerful in battle except for Achilles. So poetry as propaganda as PR steers things in the wrong way, and Odysseus is the one who benefits. In the 5th and the 6th century BC, and a lot later, there were things that Odysseus had to answer for, things that it seems the Homeric poet uh, kept in the dark, didn't really want to talk about. And we know these from a lot of fragmentary poems that have been quoted by others. There's so much Greek literature that just survives because somebody has to quote it. Imagine if you just ripped up all of Shakespeare and uh, picked up some of the pieces and quoted them for a couple of hundred years. That would be the same situation for these lost epics, the epic cycle, so-called. Number one, Odysseus 
actually pretended to be crazy in order to avoid going to Troy in the first place. You don't hear about that in the Odyssey. The person who ratted him out, Palamedes, by placing his infant son in front of the plow that Odysseus was using to plow crazily with a horse and an ox, Palamedes um, got tricked by Odysseus later and drowned. Thanks. Odysseus, with help, steals the talismanic statue of Athena from Troy, the Palladium. Athena doesn't like that. You don't hear about that in the Odyssey. He, again with help, murders the son of Hector, Astyanax, once they conquer Troy. And, and then we like to think of him as keeping his eye on Penelope, the beautiful, waiting for 20 years back home, never changing. Mm, he, in fact, is said to have had a son by uh, Calypso, Telegonos, and two other sons by Circe, the other nymph with whom he slept for uh, at least a year. Calypso was seven years. Um, spoiler alert, it's Telegonus who's going to kill him at the very end of his life. The bastard son. We don't hear about that in the Odyssey. And finally, even after he gets back to Ithaca, the Odyssey wants to make it a lovely homecoming. You know what the other stories say? He immediately went out, well, maybe he stayed home for six months, to the mainland, married the queen of the Thesprotians, uh, and hung out there for some years. So Odysseus is perhaps not the whitewashed hero that the Odyssey would seem to make him. Now, some of the other characters, of course, uh, are equally denigrated by the cyclic epics, Pyrrhus, also called the Aptolemus, who is the son of Achilles, is said to have killed Priam at the very altar of uh, Apollo or Athena. And you see in this medieval rendition, Priam looking like a bishop uh, killed at the altar. But Odysseus seems to also have joined in in some of that wave of destruction. Fast forward. This picture of Odysseus as somehow being too clever or even immoral is in fact what the Middle Ages and the Renaissance know most. And remember, people like Dante do not know the Odyssey firsthand or even secondhand. What happens to Odysseus in the next couple of steps as he's making his way towards modernity? In Dante's poem, which was set in the year 1300, although composed a little bit later, uh, Dante, the figure in the poem, as well as the author, would be about 35 years old. He's doing an Odyssean thing, too. It's not a homecoming, but it's a descent to hell. And we know from the Odyssey that Odysseus did that. But he does it with a guide, Virgil. Virgil, who is well known as an anti-Odysseus author. If you read Virgil's Roman Aeneid, the Romans, the good guys, are actually descendants of the Trojans. So Odysseus, as the main brains behind the Greeks, is on the, on the wrong side. Where does Dante place Odysseus? Uh, it looks like a gyro to me. I can't help but think of Greek food and, and nostimo. But in, in this uh, rendition of where is Waldo, uh, it's down, maybe you can see it already, in the fraudulent counselors. Right. Thank you. Fraudulent counselors. So this is in Canto 26 of the Inferno. Virgil and Dante are proceeding and they see a double flame. And Dante says, what is that? Virgil points out that these are two fraudulent counselors together, Diomedes and Ulysses, i.e. Odysseus. And then he asks the flame to tell its story, and it does. This is now the voice of Ulysses. I and my company were old and slow. When at that narrow passage we arrived, where Hercules has landmarks set as signals. So they're going out of the Mediterranean to the gates of Heracles, Gibraltar. That man no father onward should adventure. On the right hand, behind me left I Seville, and on the other hand already left Cayuta. Oh, brothers, and now this is what he recalls having said to his crew who amid a hundred thousand perils have come unto the west to this so inconsiderable vigil, which is remaining of your senses still, be ye unwilling to deny the knowledge following the sun of the unpeopled world? 
Consider ye the seed from which ye sprang. This is uh, Longfellow's translation, so more ye's than we might like. Ye were not made to live like unto brutes, but for pursuit of virtue and of knowledge. So eager did I rend my companions with this brief exhortation for the voyage that then I hardly could have held them back. Five times rekindled and as many quenched had been the splendor underneath the moon since we had entered into the deep pass when there appeared to us a mountain. So they're going so far from the Mediterranean and the known world in search of knowledge, right, that they see a mountain. Joyful were we, and soon it turned to weeping, for out of the new land a whirlwind rose and smote upon the forepart of the ship. Three times it made her whirl with all the waters. At the fourth time it made the stern uplift, and the prow downward go, as pleased another, until the sea above us closed again. He persuades the crew, that's why he's a fraudulent counselor, and he persuades them to go to the ends of the earth to explore in pursuit of knowledge. That might sound eerily familiar, because I think this is the default mode for modern Americans, or let's say the modern world. Go as far as you can. Learn all you can. What happens in Dante, not only is that fraudulent, it gets his crew killed, it gets him sunk into hell, it also is against the will of another, and the another, capital A, is God. So this is a vision right on the cusp of the medieval period and the Renaissance, where we might think it's great. Odysseus and his crew go as far as you can. Robert Byrd, the moon, all of that. For Dante, it's a sin. Another cusp moment, somewhat later in the Renaissance, Shakespeare, in one of the greatest unread plays of Shakespeare, anybody ever see Troilus and Cressida enacted? Yeah, it, it doesn't often get played. I saw it uh, in London a few years ago in an incredible production. Notice that this is a midlife crisis thing. Um, Shakespeare writes the play when he's around 35 years old, just like Dante thinking about things. And in the play, Ulysses, that's the Roman name of Odysseus, is a provocateur. He wants to get Ajax to fight in order to provoke Achilles to go back to the battle. And so he takes Troilus to show that Troilus's beloved Cressida is unfaithful. He sets up this whole pimp scene. And it's basically Odysseus, Ulysses as pimp. Uh, and it works. But it's horrible. It's really the most cynical play of Shakespeare that we have. It also contains some of the finest rhetoric. And this is the most famous speech, but I think it characterizes the moment as well as the hero all about degree, not your degrees, but degree in the sense of the abstract order. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in mere oppugnancy. The bounded waters should lift their bosoms higher than the shores and make a sop of all this solid globe. Strength should be lord of imbecility, and the rude son should strike his father dead. So if you take away hierarchy, if you take away bureaucratic kind of structure, chaos is unleashed. Force should be right, or rather right and wrong. Between whose eddies jar justice resides, I'm sorry, between whose endless jar justice resides, should lose their names and so should justice too. Then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite and appetite and universal wolf, so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce a universal prey and last eat up himself. So it's again a kind of scary moment where Odysseus knows how order must be maintained. He represents the order of Agamemnon and the commanders at Troy. If you don't have that, everything goes to hell. At the same time, if you do have that, it seems power can grow and grow and eat itself, a universal wolf. I think the moment at which the West decides that Odysseus, in all of his exploring, is in fact a good model, comes in the late Victorian period. He's a suspect quality before then, in Shakespeare, in Dante, in the 5th century BC. But Tennyson reworks this. And think of England at the time, uh, the great industrialists and capitalists, 
even if they might be damaging the landscape, somehow have this vision of the world at their feet. So here's Tennyson's Ulysses. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone on shore. And when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea, I am become a name. So he's home. He's just a book now. People think, oh yeah, that's the guy in Homer's epic. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known cities of men. Almost a quote from the proem of the Odyssey. And manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all. And drunk delight of battle with my peers for our on the ringing plains of windy Troy. And now he gives the order. It's exactly that moment that Dante captured in Inferno 26. So he talks to the crew. Push off from Ithaca, in other words, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding pharaohs, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. Well, he's read his Dante, right? It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Actually, knowing Odysseus as a rhetorician, I would be betting on the former rather than the latter, but he's the one who's going to persuade the crew to do this. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Who doesn't jump up and start applauding at that point, right? That's the modern Ulysses Odysseus. That's what we want to believe. You push to the borders. Doesn't matter if you ever come back, you strive, you seek, you find, and you do not yield. One other wave, which doesn't really counteract that Odysseus as the modern explorer. Uh, it's Odysseus the everyman. I think if we saw it enough, we might start doubting Odysseus in the Tennysonian mode. And we have seen it in some remarkable works, right? Think of the long novel by the guy on the left, sorry, you're right, James Joyce and his Ulysses, uh, published on his 40th birthday in 1922, but written supposedly when he was around 35. In that one, Joyce uh, presents Ulysses Odysseus as an everyman, as the, an advertising salesman walking around Dublin. The same mode, I would suggest, is what you see behind the Clooney movie. One of Clooney's better things, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?, where he plays the escaped convict and con man. Con man is like Odysseus, and it's got some great cameos by uh, other folks. Here are the sirens in the bottom part uh, who, who freak out uh, Ulysses and his crew by uh, seeming to have changed one of them into a frog. You, you've all seen the movie. I just want to locate it as Odysseus the Everyman again. It's not Odysseus the Great Explorer. It's Odysseus the Con Man. And finally, one you may not have seen, uh, but I recommend highly, and uh, it is a commercial message for Theodore Angelopoulos, Tovlema tu Odyssea, the gaze of uh, Odysseus, or Ulysses Gave, starring as Odysseus, Harvey Keitel, going in search of lost canisters of film in the Balkans during the war in Sarajevo. An amazing movie which takes about three hours to see. Uh, it took about five hours when I first saw it because I saw it in Crete and the projector broke down at least three times. <laughs> And, and each time I thought, okay, that's the movie. I, and then everybody else was still sitting there. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing. However, again, it's Odysseus Ulysses as every man. This time he's a maker. He's a filmmaker. So he captures that storytelling mode of the hero as well. And he goes through all sorts of adventures in which, another brilliant move by Angelopoulos, the same woman plays Circe, Calypso, and Penelope. Same actress. So let me get back to the future and focus on one moment in the poem that I think might help us think about Ulysses, Odysseus, in relation to modernity, to this past path that he has traveled, being mostly a bad guy or a con man, a fraudulent counselor or a cynic, and then fast forward to where we're at. 
And I focused on the blinding of the Cyclops and what it might imply. It's in book nine of the poem. It's where um, Odysseus has decided that they can't just kill this big monster who's been eating his crew. The monster usually survives on milk, and he's developed this taste for man meat. Instead, they're going to blind him, uh, and that way they'll be able to get out of the cave that he has uh, locked them in every night. So in these uh, pots, here's a 7th century vase depicting uh, Odysseus and crew members jabbing the eye of the Cyclops. Uh, Here, more realistically, uh, in terms of the angle that they've got on the eye, but the thing that they've got looks more like a tree, but again, it's a kind of group activity. It's a fascinating moment, and many artists have done it. Uh, a, a Laconian black figure cup on the right hand upper shows it almost like an initiatory feat by a bunch of young guys. And, and you can see that the Cyclops is holding on to the legs of his latest victim that he's devoured. Then below that, a, a group that Tiberius had set up in his villa in Sperlonga, which much, looks much more Roman engineering. I think they still have the wrong angle on the eye there, however, but I'm not the engineer. And, and finally, Matisse in a print that you just cannot uh, not make into a Freudian parable. So it's a, a remarkable moment that brings together a lot of things. I think it brings together the hero and technology, the engineer hero, if you like, along with polytropos, his epithet, which means polytropos, having many turns, thank you. I know there were no quizzes in this one, but it's nice to check. He's also polymetis or polumekan. Polumekan means literally having many machines, many mechanical things. Polumekan adusel. That's how you can address him. Polymetis means having much metis. And metis is a wonderful Greek word meaning cunning intelligence. I'm surprised that no tech firm has yet claimed this as its uh, motto or, or its name, Matis, cunning intelligence. It's how to do things. It's kind of savoir faire. It's not abstract knowledge. It's how to navigate. It's how to work the helm. It's how to drive a chariot. And it's actually also a goddess. It's the goddess Matis, who's the mother of Athena. Remember the story that uh, Zeus heard an oracle that the next child he had would overcome him. Well, the woman he had most recently gotten pregnant, the goddess, was Metis, and so he swallows Metis, but energy is never lost in Greek myth, and so Metis, still being pregnant, gives birth through the head of Zeus, and that's Athena, who jumps out fully armed from the head of Zeus. So when you say that Odysseus is polymetis, you're evoking a whole world of mythic association. He is the guy with lots of metis in his head. Side note, the fact that metis is the mother of Athena, and Athena embodies metis, I think explains a lot in the Odyssey. She never is around when Odysseus most needs her, it seems. Why is that? it's been suggested that there's a kind of goddess-hero antagonism going on. Because one thing that Greek myth says all the time, you want to be as good as the gods. But if you get too close to them, if you almost succeed, they will get you. And so it's a delicate game that Odysseus wants to be polymatous, but you can't be too polymatous. The main device that Odysseus is responsible for, of course, is depicted in this vase, which is now in the museum at Mykonos. If you've ever been to the island, you might have seen this centerpiece. It's the Trojan horse. This is a a 7th century vase, uh, perhaps even earlier. It's depicting uh, something that looks like a 747 with windows uh, and even an upper deck, which would not be a good idea because the Trojans could actually see who's inside. But the artist wants to tell you that, you know, there were people inside. So why is Odysseus the paradigmatic technologist and the Greeks by extension? Because this is the thing that's being valued in him as a hero. At the moment that they plunge the stick into the eye of the Cyclops, it's very odd because we have about 100 versions of this folktale. 
in every other folktale, it is an iron rod that gets the eye of the monster. It's not always a cyclops or all kinds of ogre tales. They've been collected by James George Fraser. Um, all of them have an iron stick. In the Odyssey, it's very specifically an olive wood stick that is green, right? It's said to be green. They stick it in the fire and it glows like iron. And then they plunge it into the eye of the monster. I think in that small group of lines, the poet is saying, we, in the form of Odysseus, we Greeks can take nature and transform it. We can take the raw materials, the green olive wood, and make it act like an iron stake. And they certainly know about iron in 700 BC. This is the ultimate act of Matis, I would say. It's interesting that Athena is also, of course, the goddess of the olive tree, but it combines what in English are two different realms, craft with craftiness. So in this view, which is just one small slice of the great poem, what Odysseus's problem is with not wanting to stay with Calypso, who promises him immortality, it's really he needs to get his hands dirty. He can't imagine being in this pristine environment. And even the episode in which he has to leave town, leave Calypso's island, emphasizes this because all of a sudden, Calypso produces tools that she's kept around. But Odysseus would have been long gone. He just didn't have the tools. Odysseus, as a technological hero then, is already there in around 700 BC. Someone who's representing the kind of cutting edge, if you will, of the application of cunning intelligence. Which brings me to a more local issue, and one I'm sure is going to get me in trouble, even though this is being recorded, I'll say it anyways. I do have tenure. That's the good thing about tenure. <laughs> and, and here I'm going to uh, both vent and ventriloquize, okay? And so it's going to be a little bit more scripted because I don't want to get his voice wrong. His voice is Homer. So even if we admit that the humanities in general don't have a problem with science and technology, the STEM subjects, I would be the last to say that there's a clash between these. I think they are perfectly complementary, and I think Stanford is the mediating place for these two parts of the human brain. There is one phenomenon creeping out of our very campus that gives me pause and makes me turn to Homer for perspective, hence today's talk. It's called design thinking. And the epicenter is, as you can read, the Institute of Design at Stanford, the Hasso Plattner Center. I'm not going to beat up on the Hasso Plattner Center. Some of my best friends go there. I've even walked through on my way when I need to cut through in the, <laughs> the few days that it's raining from Tresseter to Building 110. And, and so I've seen it, in a way. What happens there at design thinking, usually known as the D School? Well, you might have seen an article a couple of months ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which is like the Daily Post for us academic types. <laughs> it is design thinking the new liberal arts. And the article gives a kind of unqualified yes to that question. Is design thinking the new liberal arts? It enthuses over the way in which design thinking could be the template for education as a whole. And it mentions two specific D-School courses here. Uh, the, the courses are, quote, designing your life, which helps upperclassmen think about the directions that will shape their lives after graduating, and designing your Stanford, which applies design thinking to helping first and second year students make the best choices about courses, majors, and extracurricular activities. Okay, so just design everything. Now, that sounds pretty innocuous and even kind of helpful. It's not, however, I think the student perception of what the D-School does for you. Certainly not the outsider perspective of the D-School. And for that, I turn to an earlier article that you might have seen uh, in the New York Times. Akshay Kotari's first assignment at the D-School was to rethink how people eat ramen noodles. His last D-School assignment led to a news reading app that was bought by LinkedIn for 90 million. <laughs> okay. I suspect that's what the average Stanford student or would-be Stanford student wants to think about the design school. Uh-oh, we're losing D-School people even as we speak. I knew this would happen. 
What disturbs me is that too easily assumed bridge between these realms, designing your ramen noodles and designing your life, right? Even more disturbing is the kind of seamless designing everything that leads to success if you design things enough, and of course to a pot of money. Is that the new liberal arts? And if so, where does it leave classics and the rest of the traditional humanities? Um, to answer this, I called on Homer. I went to a necromantion, an oracle of the dead. There's one of these in northwest Greece. You can visit even now, although some archaeologists think it's an old farmstead. But I like to think of it as an oracle of the dead. And here's what the old bard said to my questions. He turned out to have a very tough grading habit, and he graded the design school on its principles, kind of like an old professor. In fact, he, he might sound a little bit like me in some of these entries, but that's just an accident. <laughs> so here's the number one D school principle, show, don't tell. What, what would Odysseus and Homer say about that? Uh, clearly, Odysseus would flunk on that one. Uh, Homer says, my Odysseus tells all the time and never, if he can help it, shows anything except perhaps his impassive face. It's not an accident that the entire quarter of the Odyssey that handles the adventures, the Cyclops, etc., is one big telling, a story recounted by the hero Odysseus, a rhetorical feat that keeps the audience's rapt attention, like he's a bard. In fact, for all intents, my Odysseus is the bard of the Odyssey. Rhetoric is what counts, the rest Showing don't tell, that's just pictures. Focus on human values. These are actual D-School principles. These are like the, the mantras that one must uh, learn at the D-School. Focus on human values. Uh, Homer says, I give my Odysseus a B- minus on that score. It's true that he aced the final exam. He chose a very human value, mortality, over the chance to stay with Calypso, the divine nymph who offered immortality, but then, Basically, Odysseus was choosing to survive as a mortal rather than to live a weird half-life. I'm sure he had in mind the example of Tithonus, another mortal man who was beloved by a goddess, the dawn. And you remember, she's the one who managed to get eternal life for her lover, but forgot to ask for eternal youth as well, so that Tithonus ended up shriveled and weak, the size of a cicada, and she kept him in a cricket cage and went and slept with other people. If you consider Odysseus's other moves, every time it comes to a choice, this is Homer now, not me, between saving his own skin and having to sacrifice the lives of some of his admittedly much dumber companions, it's the skin for the win. <laughs> uh, number three, design school principle, craft clarity. You know what Homer said about that? Are you kidding me? The mantra for Odysseus, not that he would ever put it so clearly, is perfect obfuscation. Never let the other side see what you have up the sleeve of your chiton. It goes along with telling, not showing. These school people are so naive. Quote, un, quote, unquote. Homer. Number four, embrace experimentation. At last, Odysseus and the D schoolers see eye to eye, says Homer. Um, I, Homer, do not believe that my ancient hero embraced experimentations just for the hell of it to find creative ways to eat ramen noodles, but because he had to. It's in his blood. He is the bricoleur, the guy who builds a wall or a raft or a Trojan horse with whatever wood happens to be lying around. The poem and surrounding myths celebrate this by associating him with two specific divinities, Athena and Hermes. Why do you think he's constantly getting that epithet of mine, Polymatus, having much cunning intelligence? The D school that appreciate that. Then there's Hermes, the ultimate trickster, the coyote of Greek myth, the one who invented a liar out of a tortoise shell. In some stories, by the way, Homer would like us to know, Hermes is actually the great grandfather of Odysseus. Makes sense. Number five, be mindful of process. Homer says, I made Odysseus so good at concealing his motives that we usually don't see the process. He just does stuff. And yet there are two or three moments that point to something else. When I sang about him leaving the island of Calypso, it was on a raft of his own design and crafting. The goddess gave him the tools. He cut the trees, made the components, fitted them together. Is he thinking of process, though? Seems more like he just knows what he has to do, keeps the goal in mind, and makes the boat. 
Same way in the Cyclops' cave. When he perceives that killing the Cyclops will mean they can't get out because only the Cyclops can move the giant block at the entrance, notice how he blinds him by plunging in a stick. And I, Homer, made the audience aware of the process with some, I have to say, of my best ever similes, describing how the stick is like a shipmaker's drill, how the heated eyeball hisses and sizzles, resembling the metal-making process, it's technology all over. But is Odysseus mindful? Come to think of it, how do you respect number four, embrace experimentation, at the same time as you keep process in mind when you're trying to save your life? My Odysseus is much more like a Zen master, says Homer, clearing the mind, cutting directly to the goal. Just two more. Homer is getting tired. He is about 2,500 years old, after all. Bias toward action. Hmm, Homer said. Yes and no. Odysseus in my poem is so effective that he very often decides not to act. With the innocent and sunny bias toward action, Odysseus would have arrived home, immediately declared he was the long-missing king of Ithaca, launched a frontal attack on the 108 suitors, and been mercilessly slaughtered along with his son and retainers. No, Odysseus, I would say, has a bias toward inaction. Along with being polymatous, he is, in terms of poetic epithet, polytlemon, much enduring. He will sit and watch his wife weep in front of him while he's disguised and harden himself to the sight so that he doesn't blow the whole successful return by letting on his real identity too soon. He knows what is the kairos, the appropriate moment. Once again, it's early Greek Zen, the wisdom of not doing, said Homer. Final mantra of the D-School, radical collaboration. So Homer said, I have to admit, not having taken a D-School course, that I'm not sure where radical fits in, other than to sound edgy like the new hot adjective disruptive. It seems to denote the unexpected people collaborate who normally would not meet. Odysseus does radically collaborate with gods, Athena in particular. Maybe a feature of almost every religion, prayer, is just another name for radical collaboration. If so, the D school starts sounding more like a divinity school. But the distinctive feature of Odysseus is how often he refuses collaboration, radical or any other. He's a loner. He's the only son of an only son who in turn produced an only son. He is the one who keeps his ship away from the others when they visit the Lystragonians and thereby survives. He's the one who keeps himself apart from his rambunctious, occasionally idiotic companions and therefore survives. Even his island Ithaca lies apart from the others, not near the mainland. James Joyce, Homer's very up on his literature, but, you know, what else do you do in the underworld all day? In composing his modern Odysseus in the form of Leopold Bloom, James Joyce was on to the essential aloneness of my hero. Bloom, a Jew in Dublin, is on his own. Joyce's other creation, Stephen Dedalus, is another aspect of the same when he chooses at the end of a portrait of the artist, silence, exile, and cunning, He chooses to be like Homer's hero, alone, radical, but far, far from being a collaborator. Okay, so now Homer is really getting winded, but I asked him to tote up the results, and here's the bottom line. Odysseus, he said, would either flunk out of D-School, or more likely get so crushingly bored with its incessantly sunny, optimistic sloganeering that he would leave after crafting his first app. The app could be called, in fact, I Ithaca, a homing device like an Apple Watch that one could put on when setting out for protracted overseas conflicts. (laughs) In sum, and now it's me, it's not Homer anymore, uh, to the new, new culture of design thinking, Odysseus, I think, offers a polite demural. He's not totally on board with transparency and collaboration. Uh, He's not dying to be the Greek who made it in Silicon Valley, If, in effect, the poem which he dominates says, no, these don't always get you so far, what does the Odyssey offer? In my role as aging medium, not just here, but in the class, interpreter of voices from the underworld, if you like, from our ancient past, let me suggest that the Odyssey and its hero offer 
some positive indications. They're kind of like sets of signs that you have to tease out and interpret, which is what we want people to be able to do in the humanities. Interpretation is the main thing. They make a kind of shaky compass, not a nifty new GPS, but here they are. Number one, I think the Odyssey teaches you, keep your wits about you. It has that wonderful word for wits, naos, N-O-O-S. How do you cultivate naos? The wonderful paradox about that is you can't read it, package it, sell it, make it into a slogan like embrace experimentation and be over. You need to make it a custom, a habitus, a way of being. You need to keep reading the poem. So once back to Greek Zen again. Number two, mantra from the Odyssey, not D school, cherish the fringe. And by that I mean in particular people on the margins. In the case of the Odyssey, one of the incredible features is the way it pays attention to the little people, the cowards, cowherds, the shepherds, the pig keepers, the serving women, the people who are never going to be heroes. Eumaeus, the old man who tends the pigs on Odysseus' estate, is the only one he really trusts and the first person he sees when he comes back to Ithaca in disguise. Eumaeus the pig herder is the one who stage manages the uh, reunion with Penelope. He speaks fondly of the absent master. He takes care of Telemachus. Then there's another marginal figure, Eurycleia, who's the old nanny of Odysseus, who's still around when he gets back home, kind of like your professors when you come back here. <laughs> We're always here. It, not only is it Eurycleia who discovers the identity of her master while washing his feet. You remember that in Book 19. It's that moment that Homer chooses to give us the most vivid flashback in the whole epic when we hear how Odysseus got the scar that identifies him, and even how he got his name, which means something like hate man. Poetically, the effect of placing a flashback right when Eurycleia, the little maid, handles her master's body makes us see things from her point of view. So Homer brings the marginal into being the focalizer of the whole story. She's like a substitute mother. We're in her place. We develop this intimacy with the hero. If you keep the Odyssey in mind, you might think from time to time how at any moment you too could plummet to the bottom of the ladder. Could be like the people wrapped up in their sleeping bags in the Menlo Park station. Could be a servant to others. We should put ourselves in the shoes of these figures, assuming that they even have them, and see them instead of regularly passing them by while looking at our iPhones. And number three, final piece of wisdom from the archaic past to where we are, Silicon Valley. Here I have to ventriloquize once more. And I have to do it with uh, another Greek Constantine Cavafy, who interpreted the Odyssey in one of the most penetrating ways, not to say he captured the full meaning, which, thank God, we're never going to reach, but he gives a stirring practical reading, and I think the best with which to leave you as you make your homecoming today, it's the translation by my former Princeton colleague, Mike Keeley, as you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery, Last Dragonians and Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Last Dragonians and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope the voyage is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when with what pleasure, what joy, you come into the harbors seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. May you visit many Egyptian cities to gather stores of knowledge from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry the journey. Better if it lasts for years so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, 
you will have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. I would like to think that for Ithaca, you can read Stanford. So welcome home. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your support of the humanities, and have a great day. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu.